Away. Thank you. Um, the title of my presentation today is The Software Unconscious, uh, Associative Linking and the Appearance of Mind. And uh, it's a bit of an oxymoron to talk about software having an unconscious, because uh, the unconscious mind is that which we really don't know all that much about. And I want to emphasize in that also the word, the appearance of mind, which has a kind of double meaning, which is appearance as in emergence, and appearance as in makes you feel like it has a mind. Uh, and you'll see as some of the works go on, they appear to have minds. We know that they don't. But their minds seem to appear from the software that's written. And um, I was thinking about in the, the panel discussion that we had a little while ago, and it, one of the uh, sort of frames of reference that I often bring to mind when I'm thinking about what the unconscious is, what the unconscious mind is. And I, if you find me going back and forth between talking about the unconscious as a thing and the unconscious as an adjectival description of part of the mind, it's because Freud himself uh, changed during the course of his work from the unconscious as being uh, one of a tripartite structure, the unconscious, the pre-conscious, and the conscious levels of mind, to his later work in which things could be unconscious. You would have unconscious id, unconscious ego, unconscious superego aspects of mind. Uh, but I keep thinking about this notion going back much further to Nagarjuna, one of the founding philosophers in Buddhism, who had formulated the idea of the four corners, which were the logical possibilities that could be considered in any kind of consideration of something. And we were talking, I had brought up the, in, in relation to the concept of beauty, talking about the idea of truth. Well, if we're to think about truth in the unconscious mind, and we would think about it in terms of Nagarjuna's four corners, and that is this. That in the unconscious, something can be true, it can be not true, it can be both true and not true, and it can be neither true nor not true. And there is no contradiction between those in the unconscious mind. In other words, something can be both true and false, can exist and not exist in the unconscious mind. And this is very different from the rational processes that we bring to bear in thinking about how we perceive the world, how we do science, who we are. Yet, in fact, they inform us at every turn, every moment of the day, those things which come into our body, the stimuli, and the things which emerge from them, often in the form of speech, uh, are processed through this uh, absence of contradiction. And in that space, uh, we talk about it in psychoanalysis as primary process. And to emerge from that through the secondary process of language uh, is where we find discourse. Um, Andre Green said that uh, discourse was the uh, transformation of psychical processes into language, that that's what constituted discourse. And the tertiary process, which is built upon that, is where I would say, and a number of others have, have felt also, that that's where creativity resides, that we can imagine through our ability to be discursive and to put things into language, um, uh, something that no longer or hasn't yet existed. I'm showing here a little website. This was a, a piece that I made, a very early language-based work, uh, when the web was young in 1995. Um, it was not the first internet-based work that I made, but uh, it was one of the first things that I did uh, digitally that involved um, pretty much language only. Um, and I want to talk about why and what aspects of psychoanalysis I'm talking about today in relationship to art making. Freud had identified three major concerns of, of um, psychoanalysis. One is that psychoanalysis is uh, a study of treatment, 
of human emotion as it's lived by the person. Another is a theoretical development of an understanding of human nature and behavior. In other words, how we live in the world. And the third is the theoretical understanding of the human mind, how the mind works. And it's that last one that I'm concerned with today. I really am not planning to talk about the implementation of psychoanalytic theory into uh, practice, clinical experience. Yet it's important to understand, even though I'm not going to talk too much about it, that these understandings are interwoven. We live in the world, we understand the world, and we analyze it. We have clinical experience with people whose discourse in language is the center of the, the practice, of the process itself. But uh, what, it's what uh, we learn from it that actually becomes um, the, the, the abiding concern that I want to draw from today in talking about that. Um, and also in the title is this notion of associative linking. And, uh, uh, you know, we think about how we think, how we imagine, how we go from place to place in our ideas. And various uh, metaphors have been used over the years talking about, uh, for example, a line of thought, a train of ideas, a chain of association. Um, these are object kinds of ways, and yet we also see how these are also uh, kind of embedded in the idea of developing software. You know, we have threads in uh, software. We have um, various kinds of processes which are uh, influencing each other, but the link as we understand a link, say you click a button that says continue, it links you to something else or it links you off the page altogether to, oh, there's no shockwave in here. All right, I'll just go back to that. Um, the link is an object. It's a function. It's a functioning of the object. I'm sorry, the link is not an object, but it, rather it's a function. Where we talk about a thread or we talk about a train or a line, these are objective sort of things, and uh, the functioning of linking is an active process. It's something that is happening, and uh, this is where I, I think um, I see in software, in the making of software, how, uh, and in the software that's concerned with processes of mind, uh, where there is a, a strong connection with uh, the science of mind. Anyway, um, this uh, little clip that I'm going to show is an early video piece that I made, and it is not about language, but it is about linking. And uh, I want to show it uh, both because it was a, an early work and also because it, it reveals something about the context from which the work that I've been doing in recent years has come and uh, will give you some sense of... Uh, linking in a non-linguistic way, although there are descriptions which make it, can make it linguistic. I don't know how to get rid of this part, but anyway, it's okay.
This was a um, videotape that I made in 1983, and I was exploring the idea that if we could understand uh, in a cinematic way something about the unconscious mind, that it might look something like that. I was involved with thinking about dreams and how images could move and contaminate in a way each other, or suggest each other, or breed each other. Um, and uh, Freud identified some fundamental notions of dreaming that inform our uh, emotional psychic processes that he referred to as condensation and displacement. A good example of displacement in that might be the, the very first image where the water, the glass of water is knocked over and the water spills and then there's this splash of goldfish and uh, sorry about that. Um, and the splash of goldfish is transformed into um, a, uh, 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 an erupting volcano. Um, there is a, a movement based on uh, properties of one into the, the properties of the next. Um, and condensation would be something in which things become fused together, which would normally be separate things. Uh, for example, uh, the image towards the end of the funeral pyre and uh, the airport voices were going somewhere. Okay. So uh, this was, it, without using language, uh, 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 this was, as I said, from 1983. It was early on a part of the work that I was doing coming out of uh, uh, using language and conceptual art to try to think about mind and how the mind works. And um, at that same time, I was becoming increasingly interested in psychoanalysis and the person of influence in, in my studies at most at that time was Jacques Lacan. Um, Although later I come to, from a clinical point of view, found that he was not the psychoanalyst that I remain most interested in, did suggest that the unconscious was structured like a language. And this actually was the starting point that allowed me to understand how to think about writing software for having a conversation with a computer. Um, like a lot of people, I understood Eliza to be the kind of uh, a progenitor of all conversational software and indeed I think we have not progressed very far from Eliza today. Uh, if you look at the, well there's, at the moment there's a lot of uh, interest in artificial, speaking artificial intelligence both because of the IBM Watson computer winning Jeopardy and also the publication of this book about the Loebner Prize called The Most Human Human. And if you look at the software, which is wonderfully open source for ChatScript, which is the software that won the Loeb Prize last year, um, it's a bunch of rules that are basically matching patterns. And these are the uh, ingredients uh, that Eliza used. Uh, if a person says this, then the, one of the replies could be that. Uh, if this word combination is present, then you should follow this train of responses rather than that line of responses. Um, Freud talked about this, and, uh, this as, a, as networks with nodal points, and it made me uh, 
think about that this morning when Brian O'Shea was talking about the, um, the, the cosmic web, these point of intersections where galaxies form. I, I believe that's also how ideas form. We have these various threads which are our, uh, in a way, um, memory systems, the bits and pieces where we've kept things in some kind of order. Uh, Freud talked about memory as a system of archives set up according to various methods of classification that can be consulted via different routes. So we have a lot of different ways into what basically in software are called arrays, lists of possible values or words that can be accessed based on certain rules. And um, these chains of associations, this linking, has to do with what happens between input and output. And if we look at the anatomy of one of these, and I'm going to show you a clip to give you an illustration of one of my pieces based on this sort of conversational thing, there's, there's a really simple flow diagram of this. There's the, the thing is, like the psychoanalyst that's supposed to be employing evenly hovering attention, just waiting, listening for the patient's speech, their voice to somehow affect them. The software is listening. It's listening, it's literally called listening on a socket. All of my characters, even between input and output, communicate over the internet, even if the internet is just running inside that computer. They use the protocol called TCPIP. In this way, I can always separate the sculpture from the computing. The computing can be anywhere. Uh, the physical thing is sending analog audio to a computer. The computer is using uh, speech recognition software, which is itself a whole universe of uh, scientific research I've been done uh, basically on statistical probability of which word is going to occur after the next uh, in a given sentence and has arrived at those statistical probabilities by analyzing millions and millions and millions of pages of human writing. And um, it has to parse what it, the output from that is, which is basically a stream of text. And my software, or Eliza, or anyone else's artificially intelligent conversational program, then goes to work and says, what do I do with this? It just said to me, how are you? How am I supposed to respond? And there it is that, as an artist, I feel that what I'm doing when I'm writing these works is constructing personalities. In um, psychoanalysis, we find the rules that a person lives by by listening to how they connect one thing and another. In writing these kind of software personalities, we write the rules that determine how a character will respond to what comes in and what goes out, and therefore give the evidence, the appearance of having a personality. What happens between input and output in psychoanalysis in the human uh, psyche is called the drive. We only can work with drive derivatives. The fundamental drives are the death drive, which is entropy, dissolution, the movement towards death, towards becoming inorganic matter, towards homeostasis. And uh, libido, which is those things which uh, promote growth, joining together, uh, eros, uh, and, and the feeling of enhancement of life. But we observe all the derivatives of those, like hunger, uh, anger, uh, things which fuse in various forms aggression with um, the drives themselves. People often characterize, instead of the death drive, people talk about aggression as a drive. But in fact, you can have very aggressive erotic drives, and they're not destructive. They can just be very determined to happen. Anyway, so uh, the output from this bit of software, this, this network of of, of uh, what was the phrase that uh, Brian used? Uh, points of, yeah, the, the points of intersection, the nodal points, the network nodes um, are where outputs are determined in the program. And it goes to a text-to-speech engine, which is uh, a, another kind of software engine that takes text and turns it into spoken language so that we can hear it. So it's considering us on both ends. We're speaking, computer doesn't, 
inherently understand speech. We have to go to some trouble to get it to listen to us. And then once it's decided based on the software that it's running, it uh, gives us something at, at the end that we can digest, which is a voice. And again, in psychoanalysis, the voice is central. Uh, one of the Slovenian theorists, uh, Mladen Dolar, has uh, described uh, as a, the process as a voice and nothing more. I think there's a lot more than that. And in psychoanalysis, we also use uh, what we call countertransference as a very, very important factor, which is basically what we sense, what we intuit, what our gut feeling is about what's going on with the person who's speaking. That so far can't be quantified into software, but that's a goal, I guess, for some people. Anyway, I want to um, show a clip of this piece, which was one of the first, not the first, but one of the first conversational pieces that I did. Hello, how are you? Hey. What's on your mind? Why do you ask? I'm just curious what you were thinking about. How do you know I am worth thinking about? Yeah, I guess that's a good question. Perhaps you don't think. That's nice. Don't feel insulted. I was just asking what you think about, really, not if you think about. This may be the end of me. <laughs> what is wrong with you? Maybe that's a good question. How do you feel? If you love me, it's the end of you. Ah, the end of you and the end of me. You're feeling quite apocalyptic, are you? The fake frameworks follow flammable refugees. <laughs> what is your name? I used to have a name like yours, but I forget what it was now. Which name did you have? Flame the same, it's shameful the same. What a name, what a shame, it's my name. Why do you ask? Um, just as a side note, some of the fun projects that I get involved with like this is writing little bits of code to teach the thing how to rhyme or how to do alliteration. How do you describe that? And then uh, one of the characteristics that a lot of these uh, talking heads that I've made have, well, they all blink. I had to figure out what is it that's going to tell somebody who walks into a gallery or museum space and sees this thing that it's not just an inert object. It should blink. So I had to write code for blinking. How often, how frequently does a person blink? How many times do their eyelids close? How long do they stay closed? And all of these factors were more or less convincing. You know, I thought oh, it could just be random. No, that wasn't good enough. It had to be believable. And what is believable? So we're back to the subjective experience of what we think a human being is. Something that can't quite be described, but as we start playing with it and poking at it, uh, we start to find um, little bits of simulation which uh, make us feel like we're in a sort of familiar territory. Uh, the one ingredient, of course, which is missing in these characters that can only be somehow given an appearance is uh, affect. And affect is, the, I guess it's a, in a way it's a little bit of a technical term, but it, it describes in the word affection uh, what, how it's put into use, where there's a, a general overall emotion plus a physiological dimension to it uh, plus an intellectual aspect. It's basically our subjective life is, is our affect. And these things don't have any affect at all. We can give them a, a narcissistically projected kind of resemblance to the way that we work so that we feel that they're like us. But they don't care if you turn them off. And we're always looking for response to our uh, 
interaction with other people. They just are executing a loop. The code just executes over and over, and, and it will do it forever and ever and ever and ever as long as the computer is running, and it doesn't care. It doesn't get bored. It doesn't get angry because nobody's talking to it. It's just there. So how do you create uh, the, any semblance of emotion? It's based on language. And in many ways, I think we see ourselves that way too. It's not what language is, it's what it does that makes us feel things from what people say to us. And so there's a lot of branching in, oh, I didn't want to close the disc altogether. I forgot that I had a menu. Um, there's a lot of branching and a lot of dealing with certain conditions. So certain words, for example, will make one character become more impatient or less um, able to listen or, or react in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a certain way. So there are parts of the software that the execution will find itself in based on what the, the input has been. And I'll, I'll give you a, 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 a contrasting kind of... Um, um, let me go back. Uh, how do I go back to the menu? Come on. Um, as you saw in the if the 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 uh, uh, sinking feeling piece, the guy in the flower pot, um, there is the fundamental thing of it needing to listen to a person and uh, to deal with uh, the questions that it's being asked by that person. In other words, the person doesn't know anything about the nature of the work when they come up to it. They approach it as they would an, a curiosity, some oddity, something that through some bit of information that's provided in the exhibition context or by seeing someone else there know that the thing can listen and talk. Um, but it, I began to feel that it was a bit like making a piano and putting it on stage and telling people, just go in and play some music. Do whatever you like. It's all equally good. And uh, while that might be very democratic, it didn't satisfy me artistically. I wanted more control. I wanted there to be subjects. I wanted both sides of the conversation to have personalities. I wanted it to have a nature, which I started to see, as you brought up, as a cinematic nature, that I wanted within the interactivity, within the open-endedness, to um, circumscribe the territory of the interaction rather than just letting people talk about whatever they wanted to and being frustrated because no matter how often you talk to that guy in the flower pot, for example, about baseball, he's never going to know anything about any baseball. N n nothing. There's no baseball in his, in his archive. So I made a, a piece around the same time that were two characters with different uh, minds interacting with I each other. I think we are exactly alike. You remove moonlight. In this life, imagine being me. Do you see things clearly? How do you feel? Sometimes I feel very confused. Can I control my feelings? I feel like I exist. I feel like I am inside my head. What does it feel like to be inside your head? Inside my mind, I can sense that there is an I that is something that's not the one who is sensing. Why? Why do you look just like me? No, I don't look just like you. I am accidental. I'm not sure how to take that. Why are you not sure how to take that? 
I don't know. That's beautiful. Why? Are we the same? I am clumsy. And clumsy how? What is that? Why do you ask? I don't know. Don't know how? What is that? You are a strange one. On the inside or the outside? And where is that exactly? Going is not the gun, on the not yet gone over. Why? I don't know. You scoop scoop. Are you talking to me? Who are we? Are we the same? Huh? Can I believe my ears? Do you feel like resting? I feel like I am here. Sometimes I feel very confused. Is feeling the same as thinking? How can anything be the same as anything else if two things can't be in the same place at the same time? What does that mean? Okay, I'll uh, go back now. Um, so you begin to see that you know, there's, there, they have the semblance of um, interests, one of the things that recur, for example, how we understand things about people. For example, are we the same? Um, well, they're not exactly the same, of course, but they're pretty much the same. So they need to differentiate themselves from each other or they're concerned or worried that they might be the same or what, whatever that is, we're left to interpret it, but they will continue talking about it. Um, of course, I, I, I think it's pretty clear there is also a a, a tremendous theatrical aspect to these works. They're a lot like, for example, s some of Samuel Beckett's works. And one of the projects that I'm, I'm doing now is uh, physically producing uh, a work of uh, Beckett's that was just called Play, uh, which he described as having the ability to be performed without end and gave a kind of algorithm for how to change it from one version to the next. And uh, it was, uh, uh, there are three characters. They're just heads uh, because basically they're bodies in, in, in big urns. So you see only a head in each. That was how he described it. And a moving spotlight that moves between each one. And the spotlight, according to Beckett's uh, stage directions, could not be mechanized. It, it had to show what he called the the hand of an individual person. There had to be, so writing the software for using a MIDI controlled spotlight had to have some fuzziness built into it so that it changes, it misses a little bit, it overshoots or uh, stays too long on one. But, but the idea that uh, th there is, based in our human discourse, uh, a kind of pathos of going on forever and, and endlessness and also endless questions. Uh, there's also some uh, virtual versions of these. Um, I'll show you one which is kind of a hybrid piece. Uh, again, using very similar gaming engines. Uh, this, was, this uses uh, something called SGI Performer, which was uh, used for a lot of visualizations and uh, some of the early um, uh, military simulations and a lot of the early virtual artworks were done with uh, Silicon Graphics Performer, which has now been incorporated. It used OpenGL, which many of the other engines use. And uh, fortunately, we don't have to suffer over Performer any longer. Uh, there are the desert is under This is a physical 
uh, sculpture in a space interacting with a uh, virtual uh, character in a projection. You'll see it'll it'll turn around. Trouble, trouble, trouble. Why do you say trouble? Why don't you give me a break? It's not a bad idea. Ideas are going and going and going. I'm going and going on. What is your name? It is something that makes me feel attentive to horses. Attentive to horses? What does that feel like? What can I tell you? What about it? Yes, and he wants the brew. Okay. I don't understand what's going on. How so? I am hopeful because it's difficult. So what's going on here, uh, technically, um, is more or less the same as you saw in the last piece, the if-then piece. So there's a, uh, an internet connection between the virtual head and the physical uh, animatronic head, and they're sending analog audio back and forth to each other. Uh, of course, the analog audio is digitized at a certain point by the computers and uh, <coughs> parsed and run through these programs. Um, and what uh, looks like uh, video in the background are texture maps uh, uh, because at that time it was rather difficult to use uh, real video uh, in virtual worlds. Now it's much easier. These are actually individual frames that are called up one at a time, not real video. But uh, uh, so they have their loops and bits. Uh, this, this actually, this loop in the background is for my own... Uh, uh, very, very early experiments. I was talking with, with John a little bit earlier. This was done on an Amiga computer in like 1988 and uh, turning the pages of a book on video and then digitizing that one frame at a time into an Amiga. And it's probably the earliest artifact of digital stuff that remained in my work. But I absolutely love the endless book. And this was based on a, a work that I was doing a study for which I eventually made, which was based on a a story of, of Borges called The Book of Sand, which is a, if you know the story, it's a book that has no beginning and no end. Physically, you keep turning the pages and there's more pages, more pages, more pages. And I made an interactive work called The Surprising Spiral, where the interface is a, a huge book uh, in, in uh, 91. And, and uh, so this character, the one who speaks, instead of uh, having its mouth be driven by the audio as the physical one is by the, 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 these, these pneumatic, these, these animatronic figures, the robots are using compressed air, pneumatics, to drive their, their talking. And yet the other one, the virtual one, is just using data, right? There's certain values for the position of the mouth that change as a uh, certain algorithm that's there for interpreting basically the amplitude of the audio, how loud the audio is for how wide the mouth is open. It's very primitive. doesn't pay really any attention to the muscles. They're just about flapping the jaw because that's how we as human beings understand what talking looks like in a, in a very rudimentary way. And um, there are, this pressure to speak is another version which is all virtual. Uh, I'll show you just a little bit of it so you can see what it looks like. And Basically, this was a piece where uh, it would listen to what people were saying to it in the room, but there was no real interface. You would either just listen and it would go on by itself, or you could interject uh, things and disrupt the flow of the, the stories, and the stories are reorganized all the time by the software. You know ordered from the official calendar by the room of Linus. We also knew that he was an astronomer, and he was perhaps this combination which led to his end. Then one of the scapegoats. I have 
have gone back to that job in Malaysia, become my new national account, this would be what I had found, what I had searched for for so long, in so many countries. I remembered that last conversation once again, it haunted me. I kept going. There are unfortunately some artifacts where the, the, compu the recording of the computer graphics onto video just break up. It's too much for, for a video. And here there are... Finally, I found her again, but somehow she had anticipated his arrival and still had the entrance. When he arrived, her top pink head, which flew with great force, the distant hilltop, and it was there that the first shrine, the Byron one built. There are two heads. They come and go based on the, the state. So I was talking before about something getting into a certain mood, a certain state of mind. That's sort of physically evidenced here by the heads changing. The tower is octagonal in shape, and within each of its sides, in the recess charge, on the second story, the center chamber is cruciform with recesses in its four sides. The lower portions are decorated with glazed tiles and upper painted plaster. So, to a certain extent, there's always a, a desire to communicate the inner workings of, of, of what you might describe as the the emotional life of the characters, or the soul of the characters, the, 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 the psychic processes of the characters. Um, but it's, it's, it's a difficult one. Um, this is a piece that uh, is kind of... Um, I became kind of interested in, in continuing the, the, this work, such as you saw in the one with If Then, with two characters who were holding a conversation, speaking to each other, uh, that appeared to be somewhat the same. In this piece, I gave one a male voice and one a female voice to see how that might change the perception of their identity as a man or as a woman, and tried to give them s s distinct enough personalities that one could begin to identify with one or the other. And this was a more, in a way, much more loaded psychological work than uh, the if-then piece, which was more uh, abstractly talking about, are we the same, where are we going? This one is like, I hate you, you drive me crazy. I feel overwhelmed. Well, I often think I've changed. Well, I often think I've changed. That's one of my favorite lines. I, I just couldn't have written that myself. It was so good. To be, to be only unhappy would be a relief. Oh, Yeah, this is the appearance of mind when the software surprises you and says things that you couldn't have said yourself because they're so, so good. Um, so I was felt like I was sort of getting the wind in my sails with these fake people and decided that I would try to push it even further because what I was basically doing was trying to make people that were like people. So I thought I would start trying to write personalities for people that were like other things. So this piece called The Animal Vegetable Mineralness of Everything has three heads, all of which look like me. They're cast from my own head. 
And uh, one of them is an animal, one of them is a vegetable, and one of them is a mineral. Uh, and they're talking with each other about uh, what this thing is in front of them and what the nature of reality is, I guess. So I'll let this, let this play for a while. Uh, that's a good one. How, how long have we been right here? As long as the stars are there. As long as I can remember. At least a few days. Are we thoroughly determined by the forces of nature? Uh-huh. I see what you mean, in a way. Good question. Is it an animal? What is that, anyway? What is that thing, really? Is it a rupture? What is that thing, really? Is it looking at us? I have no idea. You have no idea, really? What makes you say I have no idea, really? Ideas have a life of their own, don't they? They are the one who will night poses. The circuit. That's life. Do animals love vegetables? All of the animals are fine except for people. I wonder. You wonder? Really? Do you think that this thing is violent? You just do what you want. Are we the only ones who think about mine? The entire universe is made of us. We are never the only ones. All of the small particles work together. There are more of us than anything else. The wind scares me. I can break. You can break. Really? Do you think that this thing is violent? It's just a prejudice you have against us. Animals are in for minerals, right? Animals kill each other, and they eat us, and smash us, and burn us. Animals in general are one thing, but people are another story. Um, so then I uh, undertook uh, making a piece that was a bit more like um, a psychotic state. I had been around this time working at uh, Bellevue Hospital in New York with um, schizophrenic patients and spending a lot of time uh, listening to them uh, describing their um, hallucinations. And I was particularly interested in working with people who were just coming in and just getting put onto medication before they were really uh, unable to articulate things very well or, or talk about what they were experiencing. Um, and uh, consequently, I found that um, there are about a third of schizophrenic people who, despite any amount of medication, will continue to have audio hallucinations. And I have uh, some theories about this, and I think it has to do, I mean, this is just parenthetical, but it's a, a subject that interests me quite a lot right now, is that um, they organize what we hear as random sound into language. Uh, there is a, a functioning in the schizophrenic brain that will take, for example, the rattling of the radiator and turn that into words. There's a drive to organize into some sort of narrative. Uh, I have one patient who is actively hallucinating all the time, and she hears 10 to 12, 15 conversations going on, as if she's at a cocktail party all the time and listening to many conversations. But she'll say, well, these people, they're in the Venetian blinds. And these other people, they're over there uh, where the, you know, under the ground. And you hear, you know, like the, a truck is going down the street. And the truck will generate, in her mind, a conversation. So it's a way to observe this, this sort of organizing process. Um, I was very interested in how, when we hear too much language or hear too many bits and pieces of fragmentary conversation, such as when we're in a very crowded place or at a party, how we subjectively organize that into uh, uh, an affective experience, what sort of emotional states they, they 
bring us into. And um, so this is a piece in which there are seven conversations going on at the same time. There are uh, 22 speakers, each of which has a different character in it. So there's groups of two, groups of three, and groups of four uh, uh, people, uh, artificial people. These are just like the ones that you saw, but they're in, uh, just in, in little computers. And it's called Eros and Thanatos at Sea. Um, I have to redo this video so that it's big, but... So there are little... Um, sure, I can get up. This is a, a, a central sort of switching box that I built. These are little computers, and these are our speakers. So, and these are, who knows, they're Eros and Thanatos. They're the characters, and there's a net. They're in a big fishing net, which is a little bit hard to see as that in the, in the video. Um, again, the network of ideas, the network of the internet, the network of all of these communicating uh, voices, minds, are communicating over a, a, a network, an internal network. The big central box, I didn't really need to make it so big. I think I wanted to have, give it something like a brain. And these other things are more like, uh, excuse me, peripheral nerves or something like that. But um, inside that box uh, is uh, other software that's running that will direct the output from the software conversations to the right speaker so that all of the computers, there are seven computers, but there are 22 characters. So depending on which one is speaking, it will tell it which, and that's all done uh, in um, uh, a sort of combination of hardware and software, embedded controllers. Uh, I found, uh, uh, I love some of these analog chips that people make. It's an interesting sort of combination of it's a hybrid world where they're, you know, you, you deal with them by sending them analog electricity. You send them five volts and they do something. And you send it to another pin on the chip and they do something else. One of them was an audio mixer switcher, right? So it's this great little thing as big as a fingernail that you put a signal on the right pin and it will move an input to an output. You used to need something much bigger and much more... Uh, hands-on to, to do that and these kinds of things are it, it's like uh, having uh, access to, to the components of the body instead of needing your finger to go somewhere and do something or to plug a wire like the old telephone operator from one place to another an instruction from a process which is running in the quote-unquote mind of the artwork will tell this physical thing what to do and um, I just want to finish by, by playing one bit. I was going to play a longer excerpt of this audio, but I'll, I'll play just the, um, I'll, I'll play this little documentation thing. I never managed to make any decent um, video of it because it's very dark in the room and nothing moves. So a photograph will do just as well. But this is a work about uh, sound. It's a sound space, but still the, the visual experience is important. There are two puppets hanging from the ceiling in rooms that kind of mirror each other in spotlights. And um, it's a love song. I tried to do a piece which was a, a kind of ballad with the two characters expressing their feelings about each other. Wanting you more. I love your juicy wet lips. You are too severe. You make me feel too agitated. I want that in you. So I want you to be so paranoid. You make me so intractable. You are always so upset. You say so. You are always so outrageous. You say so. How can I be so insightful? So you are too awful. You say so. So you are so intense. So you say, I can never be so bold. So, kill it. So, I love your juicy wet lips. More. Needing you more. All over me. Needing you more. Kill it. Wonderful. 
So, you are always so violent. You say so. Let. I can never be so very. I want to distort you. You make me feel so far away. You make me so stressed. I can never be so ineffable. So you need to depress to enter so. I want to bleed you. You make me so awful. You know, I do. You make me feel so ruthless. So I want you to be so apprehensive. So you need to deplete to guess so. I want to distinguish you. You are too shady. You make me feel too absent. I had to contort you. So? I want to fish you. More. Much more. Well, maybe love song isn't exactly the right word, but they do love each other. It's a kind of complicated relationship, of course, as most are. Um, as you heard, that one of the key um, sort of kind of hinge points in the work is just a word, the word so. And all the emotional valences of the word so could be there. So as a kind of turning point from one thing to another, so as an emphasis, so as an exaggeration of something. And um, uh, the poetics of so were kind of where the piece started. And um, so um, I've been talking for an hour, and I guess it's time to uh, take questions. Uh, I guess uh, we'll let the computer go to sleep. Yeah. Um, on some of the installations, um, where do you locate the uh, speakers typically? Like, where are we, hear are we hearing the sound emanating from? The that's, that's a good question. Um, it's always a problem because where you really want them to be, where, where there's a figure, is in the chest, right? Or, or somehow that it's coming out of the body, but there, there is no body. Um, I, I, I guess I primarily got interested mostly in faces because the face is where we sort of perceive the voice to be coming from and the body gets you into a whole other thing about well just a million other issues so it depends on the piece um, sometimes uh, often like the 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 if then piece with the two heads that were in the styrofoam packing peanuts the speakers are inside the packing peanuts um, in the uh, the guy in the flower pot there's actually a a, a speaker inside the the cabinet with some a kind of speaker grill fabric over it so it comes out. Others, like the, um, the one, uh, the self-portrait of the center of the universe, there's just like big old uh, uh, PA speakers standing in the corner where they're really big objects because it's in like a 1,500 square foot space so it needs big sound and I try not to hide stuff too much but on the other hand Revealing all the nuts and bolts isn't particularly interesting to me either. So if I, if I need a lot of sound in a space and there isn't any reasonable place to put it, I'll just put them right out on the floor. Uh, yeah, Tomo. Well, you know, um, uh, just for recording, the uh, question was, uh, what kind of reaction do I get from uh, people who come to see the works and they see these things which appear so similar to us? Um, it, it's very interesting because there's a wide range of responses, and it tells me a lot in some ways about the person, or it could tell you a lot about the person. I think people find it fascinating because of the similarity, but also frightening because I, I've actually heard people yell, kind of scream, when they first blink. Uh, people will walk into a room and there'll be a moment when the thing wasn't talking and it'll blink and they'll be frightened by that. Um, people have told me that the works appear very dark to them. And I think it, when I look over the course of my work in general, there is a pervasive kind of 
darkness there, things that are frightening, nightmarish, um, somewhat disturbing in a way. And I think that people feel that. I think there's a lot of discomfort that the work brings to people. Um, and then there's a certain kind of playful attitude that some people will get when they realize what's going on and just like, you know, today a lot of people were laughing during it and that makes me feel a little better because they should be a little bit funny too. They're, they're like, um, you know, they're funny monsters. They're like the monsters in Monsters, Inc., you know. They, they're scared of little kids. And, and these monsters are, they're absolutely harmless, but they know, they sort of replicate our fears in a way about things that are, might be more like us than we are and not even care about us. And in fact, they don't. They don't care about us at all. The, like the guy in the flower pot, um, he'll start talking if he hears uh, a radio or people talking outside or if you slam a door. There's enough sound and it's quiet enough. They'll try to make language out of it. You can talk to him in Japanese and he'll respond in English and he'll turn it into English. Whatever he hears, he'll turn into English. It's total narcissism. So people find ways to start kind of playing with it. Yes? Um, in the dual pieces, when you have them talking to each other, how do you convey the complexity of what you have going on there so that people who view it don't view it as a pre-recorded set of conversations that you've already generated? It's a difficult problem. It really is. There's a couple of layers to it. One is the, the part that you mentioned about being pre-recorded. I found, despite my wish to not have to do so, that there's almost always some sort of signage in the exhibition telling people that it's not pre-recorded because it changes everything when you know that. Um, the other side of it, which is a little bit more difficult and is always, I'm not sure if there's any uh, empirical dimension to it at all, is, is, is the notion of living with the work or, or ex how you experience the work, how to make a work that somebody can experience in the 17 seconds that the average museum goer spends with an artwork and at the same time make it something that a collector who decides to purchase it and take it home can live with and not feel that it's repetitious. But how do you, how do you exude the character, the nature of the work that you wanted to have in a very short time and, and at the same time have it have the depth that that's really for me one of the real uh, working, the areas that I'm constantly working on and I'm constantly dissatisfied with. And, but you know what I found out? Collectors turn them on when the company comes over. They don't keep them on all the time anyway. And in a way it's fine because the works won't wear out nearly as fast. It's disappointing because as an artist you want to believe that they love your work so much that if they're going to buy it that they just want to have it experiencing all day long. But actually when you, when you go to see a, a work like that in someone's home, you can't imagine it being on all the time. It would be, it would be a too, too dominating. So um, in a way, as I, I, I mentioned during the, the conversation before, it's important to me that the works have some art value even when they're turned off. Yes? Yeah. Um, and it wasn't uh, the words that they were saying necessarily, but the pause after the female voice had asked the question. And you hadn't really um, addressed in, in your discussion the idea of pacing. And yeah. That comes into play with your program. Yeah. The yeah, yeah. It's, it's a good question, and it was a very important thing. It was just like blinking. In a way, I just initially wrote the programs, and they would just talk at the same pace all the time, all the time, talk, answer, talk, respond, talk, respond. And I realized that they didn't take time to breathe. There was no introspection. There was nothing that could be poignant because there was no seeming effect. You could say anything to the character and they would respond just as quickly. So I had to develop a kind of uh, algorithms inside the software for what kind of reaction they were having to what the other person said. And that piece in particular brought it to my attention because I also decided in that work that they were going to be able to turn their heads, which none of the other characters do. That's the, the only other movement that any of them have is that, that head turn. And so there had to be a decision. Did something that they heard make them want to stay where they are, 
torn, turn towards the other one, towards away from the other one, or look up at the ceiling. And that became coupled with the notion of pausing also. And the other works began to, to need it, and I would uh, um, adjust them based on what I, I thought it needed to give the, the experiential dimension of the work, the, the affective dimension, what it, what it felt like to be encountering it. So yeah, thank you for that question. It, it was quite important. Yeah. Um, I would make a new work. I, I, I would make a new work. I, I, I know some artists who are constantly reworking their older pieces, and I respect that because they're getting closer to what they were after in the first place. But I feel like I got close enough to what I was after with that piece, and if there's a lingering question, I can do it on another platform with other algorithms, other way of manufacturing, and uh, that, that's what's basically what's going on. I mean, the only time I would go back or have gone back and reworked something is if I had a technical problem that caused the work to fail for one reason or another. And if I could, at some point, solve that problem, then I would go and build it back into the work that had the problem so that it didn't have it anymore. Yes? I wish I had some control over that. You know, there are very few choices in terms of synthetic voices uh, on the market. There are really just a handful. Yeah, yeah it does. Um, there, and there are um, some voices that are made uh, to speak other languages that have other accents, but they don't speak English even with... A, so I got a French voice, for example. And it speaks English as it parses the text, tries to pronounce it as if it was French. So it doesn't really, they don't really speak English. Some of the words are English and some of them are some fantasy version of French made out of the English word. Uh, so I couldn't use the French accent voice. And there's a Hindi voice, same thing. They try to, because it, there's a transliteration of Hindi that's often used in, in writing out Hindi language that's not using the Devangari script. And uh, it was taught how to, 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 to learn what it was going to say from this transliterated Hindi. So when you give it uh, English, even though English is spoken a lot by Hindi-speaking people, it couldn't read English. It read English as if it was transliterated Hindi. And same with the Japanese voice. There's a, a, a lot of Japanese that translated into Romaji, which is you know, using uh, Roman characters to write the Japanese language, but if you give that voice English, it reads it as if it was Japanese and doesn't know how to pronounce English words. So you're really locked into a very limited number of choices, and there's been very little scientific development of new synthetic voices over the years. Very, very little has changed. Uh -huh. and, then, and then I say, oh, you're so um, programmed to think about global culturalism. And then I think, wouldn't it be cool if you used your work, um, if people could, if you could program it so that you could take um, situations like between the Israelis and the Palestinians and, and use the art to settle situation. I mean, the, the kinds of things that the work brings up, the more you think about it, goes wider and wider and wider. Well, that's good. I'm glad. And, and it's, it's an interesting phenomenon because a lot of people that talk to me about the work have ideas about works that I could make. And I, and, and I find that quite interesting. It's, you know, I mean, when you, uh, you practice, I take it, actively, right? Yeah. I have to get tax bills, so that's not a big <laughs> I, I only see patients a couple of days a week. It's not, it's not a 40-hour-a-week thing. But when you think about the implications of some of the research that I'm not familiar with, but how um, you can bring kids together and how you could use your work 
truly to mediate, which it does, between us and our own humanness in some way. I, just the possibilities are endless. And I loved, I re saw, remember those pieces, like, oh, you're the guy who did them. Ah. Uh, those two heads in the peanut. I wanted to ask you about the, the use of the peanuts. Uh huh. Well, I, I, I had imagined that these were parts coming from a factory, that they were getting shipped somewhere, and they were had sort of sat up on the assembly line and asked each other, what the hell's going on here? You know, so that's why they're angled in a cardboard box with the packing peanuts. It, that was the sort of cinematic image that I had in my mind, taking a frame out of this moment in the film and just freezing it but giving it dialogue. And, it's a kind of mixed idea, but that, that's where they came from. And then there's a, a practical consideration. What sort of materials are kind of acoustically transparent that I could hide the electronics into? I could hide the speakers in. I could hide uh, the mechanisms for making them move. And so actually, um, there, there's only about two packing peanuts deep of peanuts, and they're on a, a sheet of perforated aluminum so that the sound can actually come through. And those uh, peanuts are all glued together because the problem is that in an exhibition situation, everybody wants one. Or everybody that walks by creates a little wind and they blow and they're all over the floor. And I realized that just in my studio. I didn't even have to go to get it into a museum before I realized that. So the actual uh, obsessive compulsive part of the work was my sitting there for days and days and days gluing those together one at a time. Um, but they, they had this, this transport. They were going somewhere. So they were talking to each other about where they were going. In terms of the other things that you were saying, um, you know, uh, of course, I did consider, and I knew it would be a question about why do they look the way they look. And that's why a good number of the pieces are me. Because I can always say, well, look, I, there's no reason for them to be anybody else. It's not about a particular person. And then the other character is a completely imaginary figure, which is um, pretty androgynous. As you see, if you put a male voice or a female voice, it'll switch gender. And if you put, I didn't have any works with it, but if you put a wig on one or the other, it will seem to fit or not, depending on the voice. And um, you know, in terms of skin color, it started to feel, as you said, kind of obligatory. and not relevant to what the work was about. I think if the work were to in some way address certain social issues or cultural issues or be trying to be about something else, it certainly would become significant. And it's a, it's a tricky area whenever you represent people. Right. Of what, what it is to be human. There's the basics. Right. And yet, interestingly enough, they're physiologically impossibilities. I assume right. you're talking about those, those heads. They're anatomically completely wrong. Right. Uh, there's about two extra inches in the, in the skull just to give them an elongation, which gave them the kind of supermodel appearance that I wanted them to have. But there, there's, I, I, I think you'd be hard pressed to find a a homo sapien with that sort of uh, cranial structure. <laughs> Alright. Well I think that's uh, time to end. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thanks.